Hola, my name is Sandra Cortez Acosta, and I'm a research fellow in motor economic and public policy research in Wellington, New Zealand. This video provides an overview of the forestry sector in the New Zealand Emission Trading Scheme. This is one of a series of videos that's been designed to help other jurisdictions learn from New Zealand's experience. I'm going to provide a recap of the key features of the New Zealand ETS. Look at the role of the forestry as domestic component of mitigation. Give a general description of how forestry is treated in the New Zealand ETS. Discuss the basics of the accounting rules for post-1989 forest lane. And then with some general considerations. The New Zealand ETS has been operational since 2008. It was designed to cover all sectors and greenhouse gases, but the agriculture sector was deferred. The system was linked to the international Kyoto market from 2008 until mid-2015, and the system ha has mechanisms to reduce exposure to emission prices. In New Zealand, one of the most affordable means of net emission reduction is through expanding forest land. There have been several afforestation related programs and sustainable forestry programs, such as the Permanent Forest Sink Initiative, or PFSI. In 2006, the PFSI was introduced and became the first scheme to offer a market-based approach to increase carbon sinks in the country. The PFSIs offered owners of eligible forests established from 1919 the opportunity to earn tradable units for the carbon absorbed for, by the forest. PFSI participants enter into a convenient with the Crown, which was registered against their land title. After a minimum term of 50 years, participants had the right to terminate and repay the balance of the units earned over the 50-year period. In 2018, the ATS was established and introduced new provisions for rewarding carbon store in forestry, in forests established after 31st of December 1989. It also introduced a unit liability for deforestation of pre-1990 forest. Note that the units earned through the PFSI were also tradable in the ATS. The forestry sector was the first sex sector included in the ETS because of its significant role in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through forest growth and contributing emissions from forestry. The ETS treats forests forest differently depending on the date of their establishment, regardless of the predominant forest species on the land. In New Zealand, three species can be indigenous or exotic flora. These figures show what eligible forest or forest land means under the ETS. Forest land is an area of land that is one hectare or more with three species capable of reaching at least five meters in height where they are located. Has a potential of tree crown cover of more than 30% of each hectare and has an average wide of more than 30 meters. An exception applies if the area is continuous with land that meets these requirements. Forest land, forest land does not include shelter belt, belt or tree grown for fruits or nuts. In the, in the New Zealand ETS, the distinction between pre-1919 and post-1989 forest land determines liabilities that participants face when harvesting or deforesting. This distinction also determines their eligibility to earn New Zealand units. Pre-1990 forest land is predominantly exotic species. Indigenous forests established before the 1st of January of 1919 has a special protection under other regulations. All owners of pre-94 forest land who conduct deforestation are mandatory participants, unless that a third party has a deforestation right and landowners have no control over the decision. Participants must surrender New Zealand units equivalent to the loss of carbon when this land is deforested. 
This is known as deforestation liability. Pre-94 land can be harvested without needing to pay New Zealand's units back to the Crown, as long as the forest is replanted. This means that participants don't face a harvest liability, but don't earn New Zealand units for activities that increase carbon stocks on, demand, on the land. Participants can voluntarily register post-1989 forest land in the ETS. Post-1989 forest land can comprise indigenous or exotic species. The predominant tree species in the hectare determines the type of species used to calculating carbon stock and hence units. There are three, three possible options for being a participant. Own post-89 forest land, hold a registered forestry right or be a leaseholder, or be part of a crown conservation contract in respect of the land. In June 2020, the government passed the Climate Change Response Emission Trading Reform Amendment Act, or the TETR Act 2020. This act reforms the architecture of the New Zealand ETS and incentivizes greater uptake of afforestation. The Act makes several operational improvements to forestry provisions. It creates a new permanent forest activity for post-80 forest land. As a result, the PFSI will be discontinued by 2023, mainly because it was underperforming and there was an, in, an inefficient dual system for the Crown to reward carbon storing in the New Zealand forests. This Act also introduced a new average in accounting regime for new post-1989 forests. After 2022, post-1989 forest land will be classified either as a standard post-89 forest or permanent, permanent post-89 forest. I want to briefly discuss the basics of the accounting rules for post-89 forest land. The first accounting method is called carbon stock change accounting. Under carbon stock change accounting, participants earn New Zealand units as tree grow and need to surrender New Zealand units upon harvesting or deforesting. Participants face unit liabilities at harvest and must replant after harvesting to avoid facing deforestation liabilities. Depending on the size of the forest, participants can determine the change in carbon stock in their forest over the reporting period by either using the full lookup tables or calculating participant specific carbon stock through field measurement. Participants face liabilities for deforestation. Post 80 forest land registering the ETS before 2019 will be classified as a standard post 80 forest stock change. Participants who have registered over 2020 to 2022 will have a choice between this or the next activity. The second accounting method is called averaging accounting. Under averaging accounting, participants receive New Zealand units as the grow forest grow as their forest grows to a predetermined average level of long-term carbon storage over several rotations of growth and harvest. Participants face no liabilities and at harvest as long as they replant the forest. They do not air extra New Zealand units for any subsequent rotation unless they extend the rotation period. Participants face liabilities for deforestation. Post-1989 forest land registering the ETS after 2023 will be named as a standard post-1989 forest averaging. This is the second option or the second activity. From the 1st of January 2023, participants can register eligible post-1989 land as permanent post-1989 forest. Standard forestry and permanent forestry are different because under the permanent forestry activity, 
participants need to maintain a minimum of 30% of the tree crown cover per hectare. The land will be subject to a restriction that precludes clear fill harvesting within 50 years from the day the forest land is first registered, and the land will be in the New Zealand ETS for 50 years as permanent post 9089 forest. I want to share some forestry outcomes in the ETS. One, foresters of pre-1990 forests receive a fixed amount of free allocation to compensate for reduced asset value. 48 million units as of 2018. 48% of the New Zealand's total post-1989 forest land is registered in the New Zealand ETS, approximately 320,000 hectares. Post-1989 foresters are the largest group of participants in the New Zealand ETS, approximately 2,100 in 2018. Post-1989 forest land in the New Zealand ETS has been dominated by fast-growing exotic species. I leave you with a few general considerations. First, the sector-wide approach to forestry in New Zealand avoids the challenges of project-based accounting such as baselines, additionality, leakage, and non-permanence. Second, the potential scale of afforestation, especially in mon monoculture pine, raises other issues, including safeguarding biodiversity, managing competition with other rural land use, maintaining the cultural value of indigenous forests, and potentially discouraging mitigation in other sectors. Motu has produced extensive resources on the New Zealand Emission Trading Scheme, so I encourage you to check out our website or get in touch for more information. My contact, inform my contact information is here. And I will leave you with some more background information on Motu. Good luck with your emission trading journey and kia kaha.